We'll start. I just want to say uh, my name is Maya Delano. I'm the community manager of Next Base Santa Cruz. Um, we have revamped or brought back from the past the What's Next lecture series. Um, in response to having a virtual co-working experience now that we are all sheltering in place. And I thought the what's next uh, concept was great because we are never sure what's going on next. And um, we decided to tap into our members, our community and our alumni um, as the next expert, expert on a topic that's relevant to today. So. Um, we're organizing almost on a weekly basis, different um, people to speak. The format's about 10, 15 minutes of presentation and then going into um, Q&A with, uh, with audience. So um, I, after conversation with Jennifer, we, she actually, uh, Jennifer Hamilton um, of Next Space Santa Cruz was like, we really need to talk about strengthening uh everyone's digital presence that is so important right now since we are all virtual and so we chatted in the first person we thought uh with 15 years experience in the digital realm and running his own company um chris miller was at the top of the list uh so we asked him to speak today on strengthening your digital presence so i'd like to introduce chris it's all yours all right thank you very much well nice to meet everybody or see everybody again so I put together a little slide deck. I just wanted to go over that briefly and just to kind of set the tone and, and kind of frame the conversation and then uh, see where, you know, like dig in a little bit deeper into everyone's specific situation and uh, see how we can provide some kind of customized help. All right, cool. Yep. So most of you already know about me. I grew up in the South Bay been in Santa Cruz since 2000 and I enjoy sheltering in place nowadays not really we were founded in 2005 moved to Santa Cruz in 08 and we like to solve business problems with technology I pulled some statistics from you know I get a lot of newsletters and I've been attending a lot of webinars and just really trying to get a sense of where things are going to go now that you know, the, the calm has started to set in, like we're, we've all kind of woken up from the hangover. And, you know, no surprise here, consumer spending is uh, at an all-time low. People are obviously worried about uh, jobs at this point. You just see a, a massive shift in the way that people are, are feeling. And the interesting thing is it's impacting both income groups. You know, the people who are more affluent that make more money, Sure, they're going to have a little bit better runway to be able to survive what's going on, but they are not immune to the job losses and the cut. You know, I heard like Magic Leap, you know, the darling of the VR world just laid off a bunch of their senior staff, you know, people that have been there for a long time. And so everybody's job is potentially at risk here. Consumer expectations also. There's fear that the economy is going to be worsening over the next 90 days. So here's where people are spending money right now. It's household repairs and improvements, other spending. A lot of that is like groceries and cleaning supplies, that sort of stuff, and healthcare. Everything else is, is diving. You know, nobody's really shopping for consumer goods, uh, obviously restaurants. We've all gotten a crash course into cooking at home again for those of us who mostly uh, ordered in. What, what's happening now? What's up? Uh, Netflix added a record 16 million subscribers this last quarter. I'm sure that's no surprise. Internet use is up 70%. They're starting to have bandwidth issues. So Zoom and other companies are starting to cut the quality of the video streams if there are a lot of people in conference rooms. So that's uh, one thing you wouldn't have expected to see uh, at this point. Social media usage is up quite a bit. This slide is specific to Instagram, but it's also true on Facebook. LinkedIn, you know, TikTok's now a thing. The only thing that's really dropped is, is podcasting. So it's time for everybody to do a pivot. 
And I thought this was a good slide. A pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. And this is something that we're all having to think about. We've been blessed so far that we've had some, some new work come in as a result of the crisis. We're working with alcohol distillery to create hand sanitizer and help them with their go-to-market strategy and their promotion and marketing and uh, e-commerce. Um, we're also working with uh, someone who's in e-learning as a platform that's going gangbusters right now. We're all going to have to think about how we're going to do business in this new normal because, you know, I think we're all convinced it's not going to go back to business as usual as we kn have known it. There's no crystal ball here. You know, we're still all figuring it out. So obviously one of the new things that we've seen is restaurants are pivoting and they're taking advantage of the home delivery services. We have local options here and global ones like, you know, Uber Eats. So I thought this was a great quote. There is opportunity out there, even in this time of crisis. You just need to get a little creative in how you promote yourself and how you run your business. And focusing on the right subset of your target marketing and serving the people you really want to serve, that makes your prospecting and marketing easier. So we're really going to have to get to know our client. And I think that some businesses, particularly retail, hey, you you've got foot traffic, you're open for business, people just walk in. And so for those businesses that didn't make a point of engaging and getting to know who their customer was on a more personal basis, that's gonna have to change. So uh, <laughs> we, want, we need to prepare for the pinup demand. So what we're all hoping for is that uh, when things return to some semblance of normal, that a flood of business is gonna come in. And I think it depends on what kind of business you're in, to what extent that's going to be true. Things that go through my mind in terms of retail is that we've all here locally and in California really embraced the shelter in place to, to lower the curve. I think we're all concerned about a resurgent, so we can't really afford to open the floodgates all at once. We need to do phases to uh, reacclimating to public life, but I got to admit, I am concerned about, you know, lowering my guard, um, going into some place and not, not thinking about something and touching my face until we have a, a hopefully a vaccine that protects all of us uh, from this. I, I think things are going to trickle in. It's, it's not going to be a floodgate, but again, depends on what your business does. If you have something that's in demand right now or is going to be in demand, um, you're gonna to want to prepare yourself and scale up, you know, make sure that you have enough uh, staff to be able to deal with that influx. Okay, so how do we get there? You need to engage your customers past, present, and future. I hate to admit it, but after 15 years in business, you know, we had never really engaged our past and present customers via uh, newsletters and I went through the process last year of assembling a mailing list and I was able to, to put together a list of over 4,000 people and we've sent out some some test marketing and you know you, you're going to get those unsubscribes people that forget who you are or whatnot but we've got a decent base you know and it gives us a tool to be able to use to engage them when this thing hit you know I, I really felt like it would be uh, tone deaf to go reach out to all of our prospects and say, hey, what about that deal that we were talking about? Hey, are you ready to sign on that project? Because everybody is just you know, trying to acclimate, try, trying to just figure out, wrap their head around what just happened. I've held off on, on talking to those, uh, those existing prospects and I've been engaging the new ones, ones that are coming to us like, I need your help right now. But we've reached a point uh, where the dust is kind of starting to settle and we need to start engaging them because the, the danger right now is that your clients are going to start to think that you've forgotten about them or that you're out of business. Certainly there's a lot of communication and content going on right now. I think, you know, we're all getting, starting to get that webinar fatigue, being on Zoom all the time all the newsletters and stuff that we get in our, our mailboxes. I mean, we were already being over-marketed to before this thing set in. And now everybody's 
hanging out in those social media areas where that a lot of that was going on. What I found to be successful, at least in terms of engagement with my audience, is on, on LinkedIn posting things that express some empathy and relatability to what people might be going through. You know, I know almost 2,000 people on LinkedIn, people that I connected with at some point, we might have done business or whatnot. I couldn't begin to, to, to articulate that list of people. So there are people that I forget how I met them, they forget how they met me, but we're connected. And when I post things out there that, that express this empathy, I found a lot of engagement that people are liking those uh, posts, uh, maybe they're leaving a comment or whatever, people that I haven't uh, heard from in a long time. Of course, then I go out and click on their profile to see, hey, who was that person? Where did I meet them? And in the LinkedIn world, you know, you don't get to stalk people anonymously. LinkedIn snitches on you and it tells that person that you've been on their profile. And it's actually, I think, really kind of cool because in a business setting for social media, you know, that is another form of engagement. It's like somebody somebody liked my post and I went out to go see who they were and what they're up to today. And they know that I did that. So that, that showed that I cared enough to go out there. That's my, my opinion. I talked about building a list. So to the extent that you can go through maybe your Google address book or sent mail, there, there's some creative ways that you might be able to generate lists and then uh, go out and, and start communicating with those people. That's a good thing to do. And automation is key. You know, we run a small group. I don't have a marketing department to go out and, and have this big marketing front for our company. And so automation allows you to automate the things that you would normally pay somebody to do. And that sort of sounds bad on the surface that it's like, oh, okay, well, we're just automating a job out of the way. But, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, if I could afford to hire somebody to serve certain functions in our company, I would. And since I still need these things, I'm going to automate. And it means that, you know, if you have to do something more than once, then you should look for a tool to automate it. And, and don't get tied down by the, but I don't want to pay $5 a month or $20 a month or whatever for the subscription. If you can spend, you know, $500 a month on software products that automate something that you would normally pay somebody thousands of dollars a month to do, it's most certainly going to be worth it. Most of the tools are easy to use. Some require some knowledge of technology. And, you know, you can always tap somebody who, who's been there before, use the tool. There's plenty of info online to be able to learn how to use these tools. Perhaps we can talk about some of that today. Okay, so uh, at this point, I wanted to open it up for discussion. I want to hear about the real problems and the types of businesses out there. You know, what are the problems you're experiencing? And let's talk about how we uh, might be able to help with that. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. I'm gonna, I wish I was taking notes on all of that, but I'm sure we'll cover some topics and the questions. Um, I think just go ahead and be sure to unmute yourself. It's a, um, if you have a question or you can type it in the chat and I can announce that. Hi, Kristen. We haven't met before. Do you want to be first and, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Hi, I'm Kristen. Um, I'm actually, I work at another co-working space. It's a part of the PAC family. Um, it's an inner space. It's in Palo Alto. Um, we were dealing with a lot of the same things about learning how to reach people uh, during this time, especially since we can't have that face-on-face -face contact. Um, so we've uh, been working. We've definitely seen people are reading our newsletters more on um, that sort of way, but um, a lot of the things that you're talking about is automation and finding tools definitely hit home. We've been playing with a bunch of new stuff. Okay, great. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So, um, Sonia, you've had a lot of interaction with uh, people and businesses around town. Can you tell us, you know, what, what is the climate? What are some of the things that you're hearing from your downtown businesses? I think um, for the most part, we just uh, sent a survey out and I'm starting to compile those results. Um, 
in terms of digital presence, a lot of businesses um, are finding they don't know, and each business is unique, each type of business, and um, they, they're not sure where all the resources are to direct them to what is best for their business. And, and a lot of businesses aren't very tech knowledgeable or don't know differences between e-commerce options and, and, and where to start. And there's no money. They're feeling really um, uh, short in terms of not having funds to hire a, a, a consultant or a marketing agency to do what maybe they would like to do right now. A lot of businesses are trying to shift to more of a digital presence um, given <laughs> the state of things right now. So um, I don't know if you can recommend um, a good starting point or resource. I think if someone even created something that uh, businesses could go to and say, hey, if you need to do this, then here's this resource. If you need to add this or create this on your website, here are some options and links to those options. Like that really is the basic of for a lot of business owners, um, they don't even know where to start. So I'm curious uh, to that end. I just read an article this morning that in Ohio, a business is suing their insurance company because there is a loss of business clause within that policy. And the insurance company's interpretation is that that's a physical loss. Like if a tree fell on your building, you know, or there was a theft or something like that. And um, so the insurance company is arguing that, you know, this crisis that resulted in the loss of business is not something that they cover, but the language apparently is not clear enough in there. So I I'm, I'm, have been curious, you know, have you heard of any businesses that have been able to take advantage of a loss of business claim? Uh, because that's an influx of cash that could be used to uh, purpose towards these kinds of activities, these uh, marketing and uh, e-commerce and so forth, whereas like <clears throat> the PPP plan is really targeted towards the payroll, you know, to keeping all of the employees afloat. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of any uh, business taking advantage of a business insurance claim. Um, in the survey, every business did apply for some type of funding assistance um, whether it was through the CARES Act or microloan or whatnot. And most businesses have not received funding yet. A few said they had received PPP, um, but that was it. And so I did leave a field for other, to, to write in any other options. And I suppose a business an insurance claim could have fallen into that category, but no one so far has checked that. And, well, and people may not be aware that they might have this in their policy. Um, so that one recommendation would be uh, to go in and look at their policies and see if there's a case there. Because uh, mm -hmm. even with the deductible, um, that could be something. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, it, it is going to take money to to get out of this. And so right now, you know, one of the duties as a CEO, I've been doing it myself is, you know, find, find the pools of money that we can tap into um, to be able to get through this. Um, on that note, you know, in, in dealing with small businesses and in, in my history, uh, you know, the Small Business Administration recommends that businesses spend seven to nine percent as a rule of thumb of their annual revenue on marketing and advertising. And a lot of businesses that I've come across, you know, they don't have a marketing and advertising budget. It's kind of willy nilly. And I don't think people, when, when they've started these businesses are really thinking about, and I have to allocate, you know, 10% and in some cases more of my revenue um, towards marketing and advertising. So I think it's, it's something that's really important. I mean, it's this, that's not very helpful right now if they <laughs> didn't build that into their budget, but if they can find, a pool of money to be able to push to 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 get out of this um, that would be a great thing to put that aside and you know the other thing about this is 
marketing is continually changing. You know, the stuff that worked six months ago doesn't work anymore. In my business, you know, you'd write a white paper, you put it out there, you force somebody to fill out a form with their email address, you know, then we go prospect them and, and see if there's any business. You know, 81% of tech people will not fill out a form to get a gated content. And I think part of the reason for that is there's just a lot of like haphazard, really low quality content out there. Um, speaking to the getting over marketed too. Um, but you know, as it, as it relates to marketing strategy, I think it's really important that people work on a marketing strategy and not, you know, st take stabs in the dark, which we've also been guilty of is, hey, we're gonna try this thing because some person on the internet said that this was working and we, we try this one thing and it doesn't work and then we get frustrated and we're out money and then we go, we go poke at this other idea. And you need a multi-pronged approach. You need to be doing multiple things at the same time. You need to uh, make some assumptions and then you need to go uh, validate or invalidate those assumptions. And once you have a strategy, then go do those two or three or four things at, at once. So, I, you know, I would just caution people from making knee-jerk reactions that there are a lot of people out there, you know, selling solutions. You'll see webinars like, oh, hey, I'm going to give you all this advice. And then at the end, it's like, well, hey, if you buy this social media, you know, software or you, you know, publish content on our platform, you know, the customers are just going to roll in and it just doesn't work like that. Uh, so be, be cautious and, and diligent about researching and validating solutions before you jump in and spend the money because you just may be throwing good money after bad. Hey, Ted. Hey, Chris. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Good. Hey, so um, we were just at a discussion point, just trying to dig into each person's business and uh, or their, in the case of Sonia, obviously works with a lot of businesses and just trying to see, take a, a pulse of what everybody's seeing. And um, you're in design and branding. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've seen over the past six or eight weeks in terms of the business climate? And, share some of your concerns uh, it sucks um, <laughs> literally um yeah dude before before all this stuff went down in our worlds in mayhem I I was struggling I have to admit I like uh, Dell is a client of mine and I do work uh, videos motion graphics videos for them for uh, 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 events that they have and all of those were just immediately canceled and so there were nice sized projects for me, without a doubt, easy to do. And uh, so I, ha I lost all that revenue. It, it literally came back within the last uh, uh, week and a half. They, they came back with these videos and they're just gonna use them like we're doing right now uh, with online events. Um, yeah, I, I don't, issues I've seen lately, like, like I, I've reached out, at the very, very beginning of this to all of my clients, family and friends, and just everybody was in the same boat. A lot of companies were just shutting down their marketing dollars. Nobody was hiring. Um, I'm honestly like really fearful. I don't know where this is all going uh, as everybody is. Um, I'm kind of playing it day by day. I'm thankful that I do have work right now because several weeks ago I didn't. I had little $500, $1,000 projects coming in, um, helping me out. I was able to defer my house and all that, which is awesome. Um, but shoot, another month from now, I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know Great. if I'm answering your question or if that was the right one. Yeah. No, no, thanks. I, I think the honest answers are the right answers to hear, you know, to understand what we're all going through. Yeah. I think everybody naturally just did a knee jerk, like I'm cutting all expenses. I don't know which way this is going to go. So I'm going to stop everything until yeah. I can figure out what direction it makes sense to go. And I think everybody's figuring out that marketing is, is something that you're just not going to be able to turn off, that it's going to be necessary. And then it's about figuring out, okay, how does that apply to me? Yeah. 
Um, so in terms of the types of business that you have coming in, Ted, you know, what, is, what are you seeing a demand for digitally, you know, graphics, in anything on the marketing front? Can you tell us about that? Oh, let's see. <laughs> um, I'm, well, you know, I think being that companies aren't face-to-face -face really anymore, that the, the need for presentations, the need for uh, those types of visuals are pretty big right now. Um, I'm doing some with a company called KiwiCo. Uh, they provide products to kids to learn about uh, STEAM and STEM type projects at home, which obviously is brilliant right now. Um, like I mentioned Dell and then some other firms where I'm doing some branding, but then it's gonna tie into presentation work. So I, I don't know, presentations seem to be a, a big deal right now that they can share, that they can modify, that they can edit, whether it's video or PowerPoint, that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm finding I'm, I'm keeping busy with that. Um, even a local yoga studio, their online presence needs to be completely redone. So uh, I'm helping them with that. Uh, and it seems like the perfect time for them so that when they do relaunch in a sense, uh, they're set up, ready to go. Awesome. Hey, Andreas, um, you've been working with several people recently. Can you give us a pulse on the climate that you're seeing and, and any highlights? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo what you're saying, Ted, um, as well. I think, I think it is key, though, um, to kind of get the clients that you're working with to understand that this, it's not just, it's not just the COVID thing that we need to focus on right now. So it's not just a, like a three week or three month or, you know, whatever of uh, short focus. And then everything will be different after that. It's wh whatever you do right now, there are so many things um, you can do. And I mean, like you're saying, Chris, I mean, maybe you need funding for that. Maybe you need to be creative, um, but there's, there's so many opportunities um, and a lot of those end up being long-term. And so they will benefit you uh, even when this crisis is over, or especially when this crisis is over and the doors open and you can, you know, embrace your, your, your past clients again, you can have new people coming in. And then if you're at a new level at that point, then, then you're all set. So I, I think that it's, it's really important not, not just to look at this as, oh God, we, I got to get through this, this next, you know, these next 30, 60 days and I'll be okay. But being okay, what does that mean? Are you actually um, being creative in the way you think about yourself, and, and I mean, in that webinar we're, we're, we're doing yesterday with the, with the uh, Cafe Del Moret, I think a lot of it is um, the storytelling that's important. Because if you can tell a story about, and so let, let's just look at a you know a restaurant for example. If you can tell a story, it sets you apart, and it sets you apart vis-a-vis -vis, um, your traditional guests. The tourists who come who come in it's like oh my god i really want to be there i want to check this place out you know when when, when the doors open again and so I, I think that's that that's really key and it's it's really tough because we we look at this as hey here's the pain point let me address this and then in 90 days i'll be okay but there's so much more to it and so much more value to it if you can look at it as, as a long term kind, kind of have what you're doing right now a segue into a long-term strategy that's that's just as valid in you know 30 60 90 days how are they doing the storytelling is this what we're talking about with newsletters and social media um is this on their website like how what is their how are they doing their storytelling like like with 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 a del moret i think the the uh, yeah, it's the cafe del moret right next to the the, the del mar theater downtown um, they have a voracious um, clientele. They they just love them, right? And and they get it. Every everybody who goes there every day or or you know a few times a week totally gets it. But um, now what what they need to do is is so so they're kind of looking at like what can we do? How can we expand? Can we look at e-commerce platforms like Shopify? Just kind of really small to figure out some way to service um, clients, our current guests and, and, and new guests. 
And um, I think through storytelling, because it's, it's such an amazing place. It's, it's been around, uh, the space has been around since the 50s. It used to be like a kind of a burger joint way, way back. And, um, uh, and, and, and people just love it to bits. And I think the current um, Del Moret was founded by, see, and I just, I just love that, that part of the story. So the, the guy's name is Fred. He's a super cool guy who runs it. He's just one of the best um, uh, people in, in Santa Cruz. Nobody knows about him because he's really, really quiet. And, and uh, you know, he tends to kind of stay in the background. He was, I think he was a projectionist at the Del Mar slash Nickelodeon theaters for a while. And somehow he, he, he got, you know, he got the cafe space and he's doing all this cool stuff and people. So my daughter has worked for him for a long time and then she got a job at Verve and they said, oh, you know, come to us full time. And then she ended up working for Verve full time and still at least one day as one, a Saturday, um, uh, uh, per week at the Del Moret, just a crazy schedule, but she just loves the Del Moret so much. And so that, that, you know, there's this kind of intangible presence that's, that's so amazing. And, and so how do you communicate that? And so we, so we were just, just kind of suggesting, put it on your website, put all this stuff out there, put, you know, maybe weave it into blogs, get some of the old photos that, that might, be hanging up in the in the Dalmaret and just take pictures of them and and have a blog post with some you know historical tidbit and it just makes it, it just makes for such you know storytelling is so important for entity building and entity building that's that's your digital presence that's that's your thought leadership at the end of the day so I think that's super super important and and so you're asking how to do that and and I mean the response is all of the above, just do it on the website, do it in blogs, do it on Facebook, do it via Instagram, do it in your newsletters, just, just, you know, just, but, but be that entity. That's just so cool that you can't wait to get that next newsletter with obviously with, with really tangible marketing bits in there where you get a discount or you get, you get something really special, but also, oh my God, did you see that newsletter from the Del Marant? Look, you know this, I had no idea. Did you know in the fifties, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, Al Capone went there, you know, some, something like that, some, some bizarre <laughs> anecdote, but people love that. So, hey, I, I wanted to touch on, on two things related to that. Um, so in terms of generating that kind of content, uh, how much struggle do you see with clients uh, being able to come up with that content? Like, not everyone is, is good at writing necessarily, or... There's so many different things to be worrying about today, just operating the business. And by the end of the day, we're all mentally spent in terms of being able to get in the zone and writing about that content. Like, is your experience that your customers struggle with that? Oh, absolutely. They, definitely, they do. Yeah, yeah. And so what, one of the things, one, one of one way that my approach has changed there is we used to be kind of, you know, kind of the traditional content strategist where we say, okay, here's, here's kind of what would help you if you can write a, I don't know, like a 1500 word blog, you know, this kind of content, this kind of uh, a title that would be super helpful for about one or two months that goes okay. And then it just kind of peters out, even, even if there's willingness uh, so I think there has to be a ton of motivation. And uh, I mean, for, so from my perspective as an agency owner, what, what really helps is just to say, okay, you guys can't handle that. And that, that's how we've changed. Uh, you guys can't handle it. Just have us write it. You know, we, we can do that. And then you can, it could be a hybrid approach where we interview you guys, or it could be where we produce something, then you guys, you know, read over it. And obviously we need to you know, have some kind of a, 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 a briefing about what content is good, but, but uh, so, so to get away from, from the agency side, um, if you can figure out some kind of a schedule where you just say, okay, hey, look at, so let's just take the Ca Cafe Del Moret. There's, there, there, there's a bunch of super awesome kids working there. You just ask them, hey, would you be willing to write a blog maybe once a month, once every other month? And, and the ones that are willing, you know, maybe just give them some kind of a little 
discount or some some special treat for that. Um, but that you know that that's even better just to have some internal person actually you know s supply content for a blog. And content doesn't have to be it does it doesn't have to be really sophisticated. It can just it can be as simple as a blog. It's just thoughts you know thoughts on on paper that you then publish on on a website. But it is, I agree with you, Chris, it's really tough just to get a rhythm going because people have this great idea, oh yeah, we'll do a blog, and then after three months, it just fizzles out. Yeah, what I've run into a lot is, uh, you know, particularly when they have a website that, <clears throat> a content management system that they can edit, they get too wrapped up in like, but the font doesn't look right, or, you know, how do I space this out? And what I've done is just recommend that people use Google Docs, like just open up a Word document and just do a stream of consciousness and get that out there. And then you can tune it and refine it and whatnot. You know, as, as Sonia mentioned, you know, everybody's trying to make do with what they have. And so, right. yes, they need to be able to write content. No, they may not be able to afford tools uh, to be able to do that. They may not even be able to afford to have guys like you and I do the wordsmithing part of it. So um, mm -hmm. definitely having to, you know, free tools to be able to enable that, I think is helpful. I did want to say, I know that our Pacific Workplaces does have a marketing team. So I am lucky that Nextspace does have this, but again, they are also, they, even as having a marketing team, they're overwhelmed and they're trying to, you know, figure out what to do with 18 locations and how to, you know, rebrand us. So in many ways it is up to us, the individual community managers to create this. So I'm like, I've started a newsletter once a week. It's not, again, I'm, it's like not quite perfect, mm -hmm. but I've realized that, um, I love the idea of the storytelling. Um, I feel like anyone can do that. It, this whole thing even got me to be on video for the first time to try to, um, help <laughs> um, just try to like, I, I'm like, I don't have time to write a blog. So I'm just going to do this video and hope, you know, it took me a couple of tries and that was, that put me out of my comfort zone, but that was something else that, that I did. I was just thinking, Sonia, for those who are feeling overwhelmed, just like a, people are just going to be stoked to see their face. Um, and it's not too overwhelming to get on a video. Um, I, I, in fact, I figured it out. Um, I did want to ask just, um, I did want to ask because earlier we did ask if it's okay to move on just with some of the automated items that you suggested or you talked or that you talked about on your list. And so I was just curious for those who do have content ready or, you know, and who have gotten their emails together and are reaching out on LinkedIn and doing social media posts and blogs, what kind of thing can we do to automate it, especially for those small businesses that, you know, that are overwhelmed right now? So uh, automation is going to depend a little bit on the tools that you use or the ones that you're going to adopt. <clears throat> so in our case, you know, we use WordPress. It's the 800 pound gorilla, um, you know, in terms of content management systems. So for us, uh, we use forms on our website. And when people fill out those forms, we actually uh, do an automation that connects it to our uh, CRM system. So we use something called Insightly. It's a not too expensive. Uh, it com you know, competes with Salesforce and, and a million other uh, CRM systems. But what it allows us to do is to track that lead in a way that we don't forget. Because if you're just getting those forms to your inbox, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm swimming in a sea of emails and it's really hard to prioritize things. It's also hard to delegate things if you're doing it in your inbox. So if you use a CRM system, you can have multiple people have a, a login there and then you can delegate and kind of load share and this kind of stuff. And you can set up automated rules. Like uh, we were working with a, a salesperson that was part-time for a while. And so I would uh, have the CRM system assign the lead to them. And then if they hadn't responded to the client within a certain number of hours, then it was sending both him and myself a reminder to go, hey, we have not engaged this client yet. You know, if he doesn't have time or he's off or whatever, then I'm going to go in and do it because I want to make that first touch point so that the customer knows that we're here and we care. Um, there, I also like uh, the automated reminders to follow up. So in sales, you know, when we start to engage a customer, I don't want to hound them 
you know, they're busy, you know, they're, some of the things that we sell, it's not a like, oh yeah, that's great, I want to buy today. You know, it, it, it's the sales cycle is longer than that. So finding that balance of following up enough to show that you care, that you're being diligent, um, but without um, harassing them, I think that's important. And CRM for our business um, helps to be able to do that. Does Salesforce do that if you're deeply connected in the Salesforce? Yeah, Salesforce has uh, web forms that you can just copy and paste code into your website, or you can do an integration between WordPress and Salesforce. Oh, so I wanted to touch on storytelling real briefly. Um, so, Andreas, uh, I think one of the problems that we have is we're getting over marketed to where the, the Zoom meeting fatigue and webinar fatigue is starting to set in. Uh, people get impatient when they're looking at videos. Uh, I was watching a, a webinar today and you know they were talking about the importance of keeping it short, one to two, two minutes. Um, so I was wondering if you had any feelings in this, this era where we're inundated with information yeah, we have a story to tell. It's a great story. If we can get them to listen, you know, how do we get people to listen to those stories? I have a, I have a good example of that actually. And I can almost guarantee that all of you um, know about this person here in town. His name is Jake McClellan. Um, he, uh, if you guys seen that drone footage, of uh, a drone sweeping around the surfer statue with, and it had the mask on, right? It ran in the news, it's been all over Facebook. Um, that's a local uh, videographer that I've known here in town for years. And he, he has an amazing company called Concept SF. Um, I'm not even, yeah, he, he still lives here in uh, Santa Cruz. Um, and he's got like 10 employees, something like that maybe. They, they shoot a lot of video, like for high-end, huge companies. And then they put it together and do motion graphics. Well, it, it, that's changed. He can't shoot video now, right? So what does he do? He's put out these very, very personal videos on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, like all of his social about how it's affected his business. And it's extremely positive. So he's telling these stories about uh, you know, we basically can't shoot any video right now. Our company is shifting over to, you know, strictly motion graphics. And here's what we're doing. And here's an example of what we've done. Like, he's putting it in a really positive light. Like, that is his story about his business. You get a sense for who Jake is as the leader of this company um, through these videos that he puts up. And, they're, and they're, he's just got the nicest smiley attitude about the guy, right? You just kind of want to punch him in the face because he's so good looking and happy no matter what, right? Um, then he's, he's the one who put together that video on his own time of his kids. Um, uh, uh, what was that song? Better Keep Them Separated. Um, he's the one who did that video that uh, a ton of us have seen as well. So he just did that at home just for the fun of it, right? That right there to me is content. That right there is messaging. He happens to have those skills. And I've heard it said by, it was possibly Gary V, um, or maybe it was, I think Chris Doe from um, The Future. If you don't listen to him, you should definitely listen to him. Um, there's no E in The Future. Um, he says, no matter what, what you can do, do it. Right, so if you can write, write. If you can design, design. He, Jake does video and he does motion graphics. He's putting his message out there in that way, in that format. Um, and it's, it's inspiring. Every time I see him on LinkedIn, he's got hundreds of likes. He's got dozens of comments. Keep it up, Jake. Like, that's amazing, dude. Like, on and on and on. Um, that, that's what I would put out there. No matter what platform you're putting out, your content, your stories, keep it personal. Um, don't get too down. Um, you know, like I jumped in first thing here and I was like, this sucks, right? But like, keep it positive and keep it like, this is what we're doing. This is where I am going. Others will listen and they'll follow and be inspired by it. That, that's my, my take from Jake. Andreas. Yeah. I hear oh, I, I totally agree. Oh my God, just, just being personal. Uh, I just, I recently wrote um, a blog post, uh, just a little article, and I was so just 
freaked out by everything. This was when uh, Santa Cruz decided to follow the other, was it six counties uh, with a lockdown back March 16th. And I thought, oh my God, everything's falling apart, did a little bit of research. And then I was just super honest. And I, I, I mean, I didn't know how it would look or how it would work. And, um, uh, uh, but I, I think just kind of opening yourself up and, and just sharing who you are, uh, it just happens so little because we build up this armor and, and we try to sell this, this, this corporate approach and, hey, we're tough and, and uh, like, here's a business strategy and, and we're not really human beings. If you can just get past that, I think people love that. And then also try not to continuously sell things. Um, I feel like um, my, uh, my secret sauce for networking with other people and just, just in general is you just kind of go into an event or a relationship or conversation really not expecting anything. Because if you can kind of take a step back and you can just say, hey, I'd, I'd like to uh, just to experience this person, to know this person a little bit better, and suddenly something will come up. You know, and, 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 you know, it could be six minutes later or six months later, uh, it, it could actually end up being an introduction um, into potential business for you. So I think the less you push the whole idea of, oh, God, I got to, you know, I got to be, I got to be the salesperson. I, I, I got to, I got five minutes left. I have to, I have to provide my pitch. If you can just take a step back and just be yourself. Um, in in your storytelling, I think that really really makes a big difference. Yeah, that's awesome. Speaking of five minutes left, uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure we cover a few things. I grabbed this uh, screenshot of uh, a webinar I was on just before this, and I I thought this was a good one talking about you know what story you should tell, and of course you want to talk you know explain who you are and, and it says your values. Um, but you want to focus on them, not about you. And so make sure that it's really brief what you're saying about yourself and, you know, start talking about, you know, start talking about them, making them the focus of this. And then lastly, I have this just how to engage and sell and just some ideas, some of which we've talked about, but just things to take away. Videos, obviously, short. Explainer videos are, are one thing that some people are still claiming uh, work. Oh, great quote about this is that, uh, you know, there are a lot of cheap services out there that'll make these explainer videos, but the quality is not really very good, even to the undiscerning eye. They're going to know it's not good. They may not know why. And uh, one of the quotes was, you know, you, you get to have a restaurant and have this beautiful steak and you serve it on a plate with with all of the garnish and everything, and you have a picture of that, or you have a picture of the steak on, on top of a garbage can. You know, it's still the same steak, you know, it's still gonna taste great, but you know, who's gonna wanna buy the steak off of the garbage can, right? So investing, investing upfront in a better quality video is likely to give you a better result uh, than to not invest in the beginning and pay for it later on that, you produce this content and nobody cared to look at it because it was low quality or, you know, opportunity cost is huge. You know, you want to convert people sooner than later. So just focus on as much quality as you can put into it. But, you know, as Ted said, you know, do what you're able to do. Um, you know, we're, we're not all good at, at doing at content writing and video production and, you know, blogging and all of this kind of stuff. So, um, I think it's it's important to do something rather than nothing. Um, we talked about e-commerce, digital ads. We didn't talk about. Um, I think you know, huge increase in social media time. Facebook's got the better demographics uh, for uh, filtering and kind of targeting your audience. It, it's really easy if you're just trying to market to people in Santa Cruz or the surrounding areas. Uh, there are demographic filters for that. So I think um, you know posting on social media is great but only your audience and their friends are gonna see it. Um, you know, it's free, you sh I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but consider the digital ads because they're not horribly expensive and you can get a broader audience outside of the people who follow you. Email marketing, I think 
not overloading uh, people. I'm a customer of NextSpace, so I don't mind getting those once a week emails. Our customers, those, many of whom are past customers or not customers at all, I don't think they're going to tolerate me sending out something once a week. So, you know, I might do once a month and try to put content in there that's interesting and in general principles and isn't so salesy. But as Andrea said, to sprinkle some marketing things, you know, if we have an offer or maybe it's just, hey, here's how we help this one customer. You know, that's something that might be relatable to a new potential customer. There are lots of video chats that are going on uh, these days. So that is a way that's, uh, you know, virtually not expensive at all to be able to invite people in and to engage and talk. And so that is all I've got. Does anybody have any final questions or thoughts? Uh, this is Maya that I think that, I mean, that really wraps it up perfectly. Um, but Chris, I just want to say a huge thank you. And for everybody else who participated, such a fantastic collection of brain power and experience here. So I just, um, Chris, thank you. I really appreciate yeah. your time and everyone being here today. Yeah, Let's thanks for the opportunity. Everybody. Bye. Thank, thank you, Chris. You. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Andrea, everyone, for participating. It was amazing. It was so good. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bye. Bye.